fantastic example from uh, the Grants studying finches in the Galapagos Islands. And they showed that over time, body size of these two species of finch changed in relative synchrony. Uh, beak size changed in relative synchrony. But beak shape diverged over a period of about 30 years. So this species got a different shaped beak than this species. Another recent incredible example uh, was a paper in Ecology Letters by Weeks et al. And they showed that the tarsus length of about 40 species of North American passerines was declining over time. So we saw long-term declines in the length of these birds' legs. At the same time, we saw long-term increases in their wing length. So over a period of about 40 years, uh, all of these, almost all these species got shorter legs and longer wings. And this is fascinating and it's also a bit um, terrifying that all of the birds are, are changing sizes rapidly. But these are outcomes. And when I say that, I mean that the, the size of individuals in these populations is changing, but we don't really have a mechanism. Right? We just know what's happening at the population level. And so I'm interested in thinking about what specific mechanisms drive these changes. So when we see long-term increases in a, a trait like wing length, is this due to maybe a climatic effect on adult survival? Could this be juvenile survival? Could this be fecundity? You know, what exactly is driving this and how is this occurring? And so today we're going to examine that in Pacific Black Brant, a long-lived species of goose. And Brant are long-distance migrants, so they breed in the subarctic on the Yukon-Kuskokwim Delta and the Arctic coastal plain in Alaska, as well as Russia and Western Canada, and they migrate over 40 degrees of latitude. And they're highly specialized herbivores as well, so when they're breeding, um, again on the YK Delta and in uh, the North Slope of Alaska, they're eating K-Rex subspathacea. It composes over 80% of their diet. When they're not breeding, they're in coastal estuarine systems and they're eating eelgrass or Zostera marina. And again, it composes over 80% of their diet. And there are major threats to both K-Rex subspathacea, the sedge, and Zostera marina. And these include uh, climate change, as well as direct anthropogenic influence, and changes in systems, which we'll talk about um, throughout this talk. So we're gonna break down this main question. How does body size change in bird populations? Uh, to three kind of smaller questions. First, is size heritable and is it changing at all? Second, are conditions during growth changing? So here we're gonna focus specifically on the first 30 days of Gosling's life to see if the availability of this food plant, K-Rex, is affecting growth. And then third is selection in non-breeding areas changing. So here we're going to look at changes in Zostera affecting adult survival and breeding probability. And to ask these questions and answer them effectively, we need a tremendous amount of longitudinal demographic data, so long-term demographic data. And this is one of my favorite quotes that Ben Sedinger recently reminded me of talking about the logistics of working in these systems to collect these data. Um, Fred Cook was speaking about Graham Cooch and he said he sent him to the North Slope um, with instructions on how to kill a polar bear with a knife. So these were different times for graduate student advisor relations, um, but the logistics even today are still incredibly challenging. But once you get there, the data collection is really incredibly straightforward. Here we have a brant proofing data collection. Um, you can see that the nests are very closely spaced. Um, so once you get your camp up there, it's very easy to collect a large amount of high quality demographic data. And because of this and the, the project that Jim designed, uh, we've monitored over 35,000 nests. We've uniquely marked over 35,000 goslings, and we've also uniquely marked over 50,000 juveniles and adults. So we have a tremendous amount of, of demographic data to, to answer these questions. So let's think about kind of our first sub question. Is size heritable? Um, if it's not heritable, then we can't have you know, directional selection. And is it changing? So are larger individuals producing larger offspring? And the answer is yes. 
here we can see that larger mothers, mothers that have longer tarsus, produce larger daughters. And we also see this in barnacle geese, we see this in a, a large number of other birds. So we have heritable body size. We also know that larger females uh, lay larger eggs. So on average, about four to five percent larger eggs from the smallest to largest female. They lay more eggs and they lay those eggs earlier in the year. So this is really important because goslings that hatch earlier um, have more time to grow. They have more rapid access to food resources. These bigger goslings, so the goslings that are larger at 30 days, are much more likely to survive their first year of life and to breed as adults. So larger goslings have increased lifetime fitness. So to just kind of show this graphically, we should think larger females lay more and larger eggs. This leads to more and larger goslings. So over time, we should be seeing more and more large females. Um, leading to more and more large goslings, and we should see an increase in body size at the population level. So I kind of put all this together in my head and I went back and looked at the data. We expected to see an increase in tarsus length. And this is what the data show. We're actually moving in the, the opposite direction of what we've expected. And tarsus length has declined by almost a millimeter, which doesn't sound like much, but if you scale this to, to humans, this is about a change of an inch in adult height over 30 years. So this is a, a dramatic decline in body size counter to what we expected. So the first question, is size heritable? Yes. Is it changing? Yes, but it's changing in the opposite direction of what we expected. So now let's think about conditions during growth and development. I mentioned previously that Kvac subspathacea is incredibly important uh, to branch gosling growth and development. Here we can see a photo of Kvac subspathacea. Uh, surprisingly, somewhat surprisingly, these are the same species of plants, this lush green plant and this short, dense um, brown sedge. It's just a different growth form. This growth form that's shorter is extremely nitrogen rich, so it's going to lead to larger goslings and faster gosling growth rates. This taller growth form is nitrogen poor, so it's going to lead to lower gosling growth rates. And the growth form of this plant is a function of disturbance and climate. So first, when we think about the effects of weather or climate or latitude, um, when we're further north, we get large expanses of this plant. And I apologize for the quality of these images, but really large expanses of K-Rex subspathacea. When we're further south, it's much more likely to turn into this taller growth form that's less nitrogen rich. So here we've created a grazing lawn. This is actually a grazing exclosure, and you can see without grazing pressure, it's gonna to revert to this taller growth form. So when we think about disturbance, we have a really interesting interaction. In the subarctic, disturbance is good. Here you can see this more nitrogen rich, shorter growth form growing in the paths to our tents and camp. Here again is this grazing exposure. You can see when there's heavy grazing by Brant, Goslings, and adults, we get more and more nitrogen rich, uh, shorter growth form, KREX. In the Arctic, we kind of have the opposite effect, um, at least at an extreme level, where when we have really, really heavy grazing, we can see. Um, the, the vegetation has been almost denuded here. So we have a really inter interesting interaction between climate and disturbance. In southern latitudes, we need heavy disturbance to create these really nice grazing lawns. In northern latitude, when we have extreme disturbance, um, we can see you know, negative effects of, of this extreme disturbance. And so where we work in these southern latitudes, we're seeing kind of a shift to, to warmer summers, which leads to more growth. And we're also seeing less disturbance over time. We're getting less and less grazing, grazing pressure on these grazing lawns. And that's primarily due to Arctic fox predation of eggs. 
so there's been some really interesting work um, in the Arctic, not quite as much work at, at our study site, but a single fox can remove about a thousand eggs a day, or excuse me, not a day, uh, a season on average. So our colony has about 2,000 pairs, a modal clutch size of four. If you have six to eight foxes running around, you can almost reduce nest success to zero. And fox dynamics are, are very complex. They're driven by vole cycles, and they're also driven by um, marine mammals that wash up. So the foxes will actually overwinter in these marine mammals. Uh, they'll defecate inside the whale. They'll eat the whale. I've seen up to six foxes spend the entire winter inside a whale. And so I wanted to make a, a quick side reference. It's been challenging, I'm sure, for everyone to, to stay inside during COVID and restrict your movements, but you're not living inside a whale with, with five angry other foxes. So that's a, a way to think a little bit more positively about the situation. So these, these interactions are, are really complex. Um, we have voles and kind of random marine mammals washing up affecting fox dynamics. This affects goslings. This affects the amount of grazing log. And over time, as, we, as we've seen increased predation, we've seen less and less grazing log at the site. And I really want to highlight Madeline Loma and Cheyenne Acevedo's contribution to this project with a couple of papers showing long-term declines and lawn extent. And this has led to long-term declines here in Gosling growth rates. So this is in grams per day since the beginning of the study. We've seen a decline on average of two to three grams per day. Once you take that out to 30 days, that's about a 10% change in Gosling weight at 30 days of age. So unsurprisingly, as we've suppressed growth during the first 30 days of life, we've seen smaller adults. So this is tarsus length of adults here. This is growth rate of goslings. When we have high growth rates, we get large adults. When growth rates are much lower, we get smaller adults. But this only explains about 20% of the variation in adult size. Right. So we've seen this long term decline in adult size. Part of it is due to guys and growth rates, but it's only about 20 percent. So, yes, they are changing, but they don't explain the whole story. So we thought we'll we'll now look at selection in non breeding areas to see how that's affecting these changes in body size and brand populations. And again, Brant, our specialist herbivores on Zostra Marina during the non breeding season. Uh, typically called eelgrass. Eelgrass is declining uh, in Mexico. It's declining due to changing estuarine inputs. Um, oyster aquaculture can affect brand behavior. And we also see effects, long term effects of these major El Nino events on eelgrass as well. So I wanted to highlight uh, there's a lot going on in the breeding areas, but Brant spend the vast majority of their time in coastal estuarine systems primarily feeding on eelgrass. This is a great photo from Eisenbeck Lagoon. You can see their, their specialist herbivores. That's what they're focused on, is these eelgrass beds. And we know climate and human actions affect eelgrass. Um, I go back here and highlight all these areas that have major um, warming anomalies are major brand wintering areas. We know climate can exacerbate selection pressures or change selection pressures in bird populations. And so we examined long term changes in survival and breeding propensity of Brant as a function of eelgrass. And we looked at long term trends. We looked at the, the effect of major El Nino and La Nina events. And then we looked at potential for interactions with long-term declines in eelgrass and climatic oscillations on the effect of size on survival and breeding propensity. So that's a lot to take in, but I'm gonna try to really carefully walk us through these figures. Here, the black circles are gonna be smaller than average brand. The gray circles are gonna be average brand. The white circles are gonna be really large brand. And we're going to look at survival and breeding propensity at the beginning of the study and at the end of the study. 
So here we have survival at the beginning of the study in 1988. And we can see that larger individuals have higher survival rates than smaller individuals during La Nina events, during normal years, and during El Nino events. So larger individuals survive at greater rates. We fast forward 25 years, we can see that during climatic oscillations, smaller individuals now have higher survival rates than larger individuals. And during typical years, this advantage of being big is gone. Right, so this is totally flipped over 25 years. It's now better to be small. So, so smaller individuals survive the same or better now. And what about breeding probability? At the beginning of the study, we see either no effect or maybe a slight positive effect of being large relative to being small. Now, 25 years later, we can see that small individuals are much more likely to breed than large individuals during La Nina and normal years. During El Nino events, we see major declines in breeding probability. So smaller individuals breed more often than larger individuals now. And so this is kind of the final piece of our puzzle here. We've seen that selection in non-breeding areas is changing. And these mechanisms explain some of the additional variation, although I want to highlight there's a lot more to learn and model. Uh, there have been a couple of really exciting recent papers providing new tools um, to think about how to kind of explicitly model these changes in body size and their contributions to changes in population trajectories. So we're excited to take what we've already done and put it into some of these new frameworks. So when we think about you know, our, our ultimate question, how does body size change in populations? Well, it's complicated. Um, we have whales and voles affecting foxes that affects the number of goslings that affects their habitat. In non-breeding areas, we have human actions affecting the amount of eelgrass available to brand. And then underlying all of this is climate and anthropogenic actions. And I want to highlight that this is a really simple system. We have about 5 to 10 percent of the brand population marked on average. They spend the vast majority of their lives within five kilometers of the coastline and they eat basically two things. So it's incredibly humbling and exciting to me to have the system where we really should know almost everything. Um, and there's still still so much more to learn and think about. And I wanted to close by saying that these processes are happening in every species. So we can think about any bird species in the world here. I've highlighted juncos. They have declining tarsus here in this kind of flyway. In other areas, other subspecies may be experiencing different selection pressures. So this is really fascinating that we can have, you know, within one species or two species, all these different um, processes occurring across different demographic components. I wanted to close by acknowledging the, the co-authors that have um, really helped drive and shape this work. Uh, Jim has obviously um, developed this long-term study. I've worked very closely with Madeline and Cheyenne um, to kind of put some of these pieces together with other manuscripts. Uh, Alan has been a really great uh, kind of formerly PhD student on the project, but he's been a really great mentor as well. And uh, it's been really phenomenal working with Perry Williams over the last few years and uh, beginning to start to learn how math works. I'm still working on that. So with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Great, Thomas. Thank you for the presentation. Um, we do have some time for a few questions. Again, if you have a question, please type your name in the chat box. I will go through the list and ask each person, and then they can ask their question directly to the speaker. Um, if you prefer to type your question into the chat box, you can do that as well, and I can read it out to the speaker. Um, we'll give a few minutes here for questions now. Thomas, it looks like uh, Dave Coons has a question. Go ahead, Dave, and uh, unmute your microphone, and you can ask Thomas directly. Hey, Thomas. 
I, I was wondering if you could speculate for us why you think smaller is better now in terms of how it affects their, uh, their carryover effect of survival and the effect on breeding probability. Yeah, thanks, Dave. That's a great question. Um, it's kind of interesting. I, I think larger individuals from what has been published uh, might compete for resources better, but I'm guessing it has something to do with just requiring fewer resources and resource poor environments and then potentially being um, requiring fewer resources to migrate would be my guess. Cool. Uh, Thomas, I, I have a question for you, I think. Um, so it, it sounds like potentially the Carex growth is influenced by both um, climate and then foxes from predation. Did you see any difference in gosling growth rates on the years when foxes were not on the colony? Like, I guess it'd be the subsequent year when, when goslings did have a chance to mow down those grazing lawns? Um, I haven't looked at it that, I guess, at that short of a time scale. So I yeah. think what happens is this grazing lawn is created and it persists for a few years. Um, I showed a few photos of the pathways to our tents. And you can still see the pathways to tent sites that were there a year or two years ago. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of a, a trade-off. You have a tremendous amount of grazing pressure in one year. Let's say you have a good year, like you mentioned. That's going to expand the amount of sedge available. And then in the, the next year, you might expect to see higher growth rates when there's more sedge on the colony. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, it looks like we still have time for another question or so if anybody has one. Uh, I'll give a, a, another minute here or so. If not, we'll uh, switch over here in a minute. I guess it looks like, Thomas, you've already shop, uh, stopped sharing your screen. So let's go ahead and uh, switch over. Thank you again, Thomas, for the presentation. Um, Emily, if you'd like to bring up your presentation here, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Our second speaker today is Emily Cavalier. Emily started her career at Oregon State University studying environmental and soil sciences. She moved to Western Washington University for her master's on phosphorus dynamics and sediments mobilized after dam removal. In 2013, Emily ended up at the University of Saskatchewan studying, of all things, water limnology. This work piqued her interest in springtime nutrient transport, and soon after, she started a postdoc position with the Prairie Water Project, assessing prairie-wide stream nutrient drivers, wetland biogeochemistry, and ecosystem services. She continues this work as a ResNet postdoc, a research network of social and natural sciences seeking to enhance resiliency of ecosystem services across Canada. The title of Emily's presentation is When Wetlands Disappear, What Happens? An Approach for Assessing Changes to Ecosystem Services Using Integrated Models of Hydrology, Biogeochemistry, and Biodiversity. Welcome, Emily, and you should now have control of the screen. Take it away. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, it is up there. Okay, great. And you can hear me clearly. Uh, so everyone, thanks for sticking around for my presentation.